Thank you, Catherine, and welcome, everybody. Um, we are talking about Twitter for Business today, and I just wanted to talk briefly about why me, as Catherine had said, I've been on Twitter um, since day one. This was my first message, and that was on March 31st of 2006, two and a half years ago. So I've been using Twitter daily for a long time, and I've seen it change a lot. I've really been watching how people and companies are using it. And I'm going to be able to talk to you both about how it's changed and where people are with it today, what are the, the best practices today. So the things we're covering today, what is Twitter, business use and best practices, and as Catherine said, a lot of Q&A. So do queue up your questions for later on, because we'll, we'll, the whole second half of the hour will be for questions. Hey, Sarah, we're already yeah. having an interesting question. Um, yeah. Someone's asking, is there a hashtag for this event? That's a great question. Um, I don't think we had created one, but we could certainly say um, Twitter for business with a um, the four as a number should be pretty easy. Or Twitter for biz. Let's do that. Twitter numeral Twitter four B I Z. Okay, I'll I'll send that to everyone. Great, that's terrific. Um, so in in talking about what Twitter is. Um, I wanted to just share a visual picture that I find helpful in thinking about it. Um, for those of you who have read Harry Potter, you might remember the Marauders map, which let the person who held the map see other people on the map and where they were going, what they were doing. Twitter is a lot like that. It lets you see people in your world, what they're up to, what they're thinking, where they're going, who they're meeting with. People talk all the time about the things that they're doing and what's on their mind, and Twitter gives you insight into that. It's just a helpful way to think about the whole system. Now, Twitter is like a bunch of things you already know. It, it, it shares characteristics with email, with IM, with texting, with RSS, with blogs, with social networks, but it has a number of characteristics that are pretty unique. Three in particular we're going to talk about briefly. Um, the first is that the messages are really short. On Twitter, there are 140 characters, and to make that concrete, this unusually helpful sentence, including all of the spaces and all of the punctuation, is precisely 140 characters long. So you can see 140 characters is about a sentence or two. It's pretty quick to write or read. Imagine if all of your email were this short. It would really be a huge <laughs> weight lifted. Um, and one of the nice things about Twitter is that you can spend 10 minutes a day writing, reading messages, and get really engage a lot, write a lot of messages, or read a lot of messages. Um, the second thing about Twitter that I think is really uh, unusual about it is that the messages are public by default. You can set them to private, but the default setting is public, and almost everybody keeps it that way. And that means two things. Your, your messages show up on the public timeline, which is this, which is just a, a, a screen that shows everybody's messages on Twitter. It just scrolls constantly. And you can see there are messages in a lot of different languages. We've got profanity. You get the whole range of things in the everyone stream. Um, and so anybody, whether they're on Twitter, whether they're logged into Twitter or not, can see these. The other thing is that the messages are not only public, but people can also opt to get them from you. They're, they're opt-in. Um, and in tw on Twitter, that's called following. You choose to follow somebody means that you're going to get their, uh, their messages directly. Um, now, that's an interesting model. It's different from other social networks where you have to approve each other. On Twitter, you, you just choose to follow somebody whose messages are public, and you get a stream of their messages. So to give you an example of that, this is um, a, a slice of Tim O'Reilly's page. And you can see that there are 13,000 people or so following Tim. They're getting his messages directly. Um, and Tim didn't have to approve or know 13,000 people. They've just chosen. They've opted to get his messages. Now, what you can't see under that black, the big black arrow that I've added, is that Tim's only following about 300 people. There's no direct relationship between who you're following and who follows you, which makes it a, a little bit of a tricky system for spammers. There are lots of ways spammers have found around this, of course. But because you choose what you get, if you don't like what someone's saying, or if it's just too much volume, you just stop following them. Um, the third thing that makes Twitter really unusual is that it, there are a lot of delivery mechanisms. It can go with you. It can be wherever you are. It's whatever system works for you. So you can get and send messages on your phone. You can do it through a third-party client. This is Twirl. And when I say a third-party client, I mean like an email. Um, you can use Outlook. You can use Eudora. You can use Thunderbird. You can use all these different programs to get the same messages. There are a whole bunch of clients you can use for Twitter. Um, you can get Twitter.
Twitter via RSS feed, or you can use it through the Twitter website. You can send and receive messages through the site itself. And I just want to do a quick tour of that page for people who are totally new to Twitter and show you just a couple of the important things. Um, this is the account page for Tweet Report, which is an account I created, a Twitter account I created last week to send uh, updates and um, information about Twitter following the publication of our O'Reilly report. Um, and you can see here, this box at the top is where you send a message. And the cool thing about the box is that it has a counter. It counts down from 140 to let you know where you are in, uh, with respect to the limit. Um, the bulk of the page, all those messages on the left, are messages from people that we're following on Tweet Report. They're, they're people that we have chosen to follow. And the messages appear in reverse chronological order with the, the most recent first. And on the Twitter website, if you want to get a, the, a new batch of messages, you just refresh the page. Now, when you're logged into your own site, in the upper right corner over here, you see three things, the number of updates that you send or messages, um, the number of people who are following you, that's the 90, and the number of people you're following. Um, underneath that, there are a handful of tabs in here that talk about um, replies and messages. We'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, favorites, if you're keeping track of those. That everyone tab is the public timeline we just saw. And below that is a, is, are pictures of all the people that we're following. And anybody else can see all the people that we're following. And what's cool about that is those icons for each of the people are actually links to their site. So if we wanted to figure out whether we wanted to follow, somebody else came to this page and wanted to see who else is there, they might want to follow the people, you just click through. So you could click any of them. For instance, this happens to be the icon for Laura Fitton, who's a, a microblogging expert herself. If you click that, you go to her page and you could start following her. If you're new to Twitter, that's following these links is a good way to figure out who you might want to connect with. So we talked about the short messages, the public messages, and opt-in, and the delivery mechanisms. Um, one other thing worth noting about Twitter is that it's a many-to-many -many system. It's like everybody has the Marauder's Map, and everybody is on the Marauder's Map. But there are two ways that you can send messages to an individual. One is public, and one is private. The public way you can send a message to an individual is called an at reply. And this is a system that uh, Twitter users created themselves early on, because there was no um, specific way to let somebody know you were talking just to them. People have since developed this, and I'm going to show you an example. Um, a, a woman whose handle is S. Blancara had written a note to Tweet Report asking us about Twitter for dummies. Now, we're not writing it. I happen to know that Laura Fitton, who's at, who Twitter's under at Pistachio, was writing it. And I wanted to write back to S. Blancara and let her know. So I prefaced the message with the at symbol, followed by her account name, wrote her a message, and I also referred to Laura Fitton. And when I referred to her, I used the at symbol. Now, the at symbol, which is common, to, to use the at symbol to address somebody or refer to them. And this is a public message. Anybody can see it. One of the cool things is that the at symbol turns that account name into a link. So you can see that Esplancara and Pistachio are gray. That's just the, the showing you that there are links here. And if you click through, you'll go to their pages. So at reply has become a really um, critical linking system in all of Twitter and helps you find other people and other messages that are important. Um, the other way to send a message to an individual on Twitter is uh, privately, or a direct message, DMs people call them. And in order for direct messages to work, you have to be following each other. That's particularly important for companies. For people who follow you, you almost certainly want to follow them so that if you get into any kind of a conversation that would be better done in private, you can take it to direct messages. Um, and it gives people another way to, to reach out to you. Um, just to show you what they look like under that direct messages tab, you'll get a list of them. And in this case, this is actually um, Laura Fitton. She saw the message I sent to S. Blancara and responded to me privately, um, thanking me for the redirect. Now, we've been talking about some of the details. I just want to give you the big picture. Um, right now, Twitter has about 3.5 million users. And interestingly, it's grown about 500% since last October. And in, since the very beginning, Twitter has had the same percentage of active users. So whether they had about 50 people or they've got 3.5 million people, the percentage of active users has stayed constant, which is really unusual. Normally in services like this, you expect the active users to tail off as you get more and more tire kickers and fewer and fewer people overall who take to it. 
But um, good news for Twitter, people seem to, at the same rate, find it really compelling. Um, about a million messages a day go through Twitter. And this week, the one billionth message was served through the system. Um, so obviously, we expect all that to grow pretty quickly in the next year. Um, so just recapping, short messages, the public messages that are opt-in, and the many delivery mechanisms make Twitter really powerful and unlike other kinds of systems that you use normally. Um, so let's talk about business use and best practices. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Twitter is that it has, there, there, are, it, there are probably about 250, maybe even 300 systems like Twitter now that let you send messages, short messages, um, in various ways. And there's not yet any term that's agreed on for what is this thing. Is it, people call it micro-sharing, micro-updating, micro-messaging, micro-streaming. Micro-blogging is a common one. And in this case, I'm, I'm referring to it because, particularly for businesses, uh, micro-blogging and regular-sized blogging share a lot of similar characteristics. So in both systems, you, people send personal updates or share personal information. In both systems, people share links. Both sizes of blogging are good for sharing links, for spreading ideas, and for thought leadership. Um, companies, in particular, use both systems for customer service, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in a minute. Companies also have figured out how to use blogging systems for customer conversations. And a lot of PR and marketing folks um, have learned how to really be conversational and engage with customers as a completely different way of uh, communication. And microblogging, like regular size blogging, is, is great for conversations. Um, finally, blogging of all kinds is good for letting you monitor buzz about your company. So, Presumably, everybody has at least Google Alerts letting you know when people are blogging about you or your company. Um, you, you may have some very elaborate system for monitoring the blogosphere. But Twitter is a great place for keeping track of sentiment. John Battelle has called it a sentiment machine, which I think is very apt, because people are just spending all day talking about what they're doing and what they're thinking about. And if they're intersecting with your products or your services, they're going to Twitter about you, and it's going to show up. Here's how you can find what they're saying. Twitter has, oops, this didn't quite um, align on this screen, but you can see it just fine. Twitter has a search site. It's separate from the main site, so you need the, the separate URL, search.twitter.com. Um, and this is what it looks like, correct? Right? That's, you can see what it looks like fine. A um, couple of things to note here. On the right, there are the trending topics. And those change a couple of times an hour. They're the 10 most popular things being talked about on Twitter at, every, at any given moment. Um, and during the elections, for example, in the run-up to the election, Sarah Palin was a constant uh, there. She has since faded. Um, but it's an interesting place to just take a look at what people are paying attention to. And things show up on Twitter now far before they show up in the mainstream media. Sometimes it's a matter of minutes, but a lot of times it's a matter of hours or days. So it's just an interesting place to keep an eye. Now, I just I wanted to, to share a little story about um, monitoring Twitter for business use. I've run a search here for Crowdvine. Now, the disclosure is that Crowdvine is a, uh, a startup run by my partner, but there's a good story associated with it, which is why I chose him. Um, Crowdvine provides online social networks for events, for conferences, and other kinds of events. And if you were to scroll down the page here this, on this same search, you can see on this search, by the way, that it just returned results where people were talking about Crowdvine. If you were to scroll down on the page, you would get here more results about Crowdvine. And I'm going to highlight them in reverse chronological order. Um, a woman named Karen Blakeman, a couple of nights ago, was complaining about Crowdvine. Um, she was. She had to use it. She was a speaker at a conference that ha was using it. She needed to sign in, and she was really struggling. And she complained about it publicly on Twitter. Tony, who owns Crowdvine, monitors Twitter very carefully for mentions of Crowdvine. And he saw that message about 10 minutes after she sent it. And he responded to her up here, um, asking her if there was anything he could do. They went back and forth a couple of times. And it turned out that they eventually moved it to email. It turned out that there was a bug on Crowdvine that was causing the interface not to work. And he was able to get that fixed 
diagnosed and fixed within 10 or 15 minutes of her complaint. If he hadn't been monitoring Twitter, he probably wouldn't have learned about this till the next day. It, it happened at about midnight. You can see that her message says it was five days ago, and his message says four days ago. It was all around midnight Pacific um, a couple nights ago. But he probably wouldn't have known, and she could have been complaining about it publicly for hours before he had discovered if he hadn't been on top of Twitter. Or he may never have learned that there was a problem. Um, so this really gave him an opportunity to respond in a way that pleased her greatly and was great for the customers of the Crowdvine, the conference that had hired him. Now, one other interesting note here, before Tony even responded to Karen, one of his competitors jumped in and told her to use, um, a, suggested a different service. Now, one of the things to learn here, of course, is that you can be monitoring Twitter for your own company, you can be monitoring it for mentions of your competitors, and for mentions of things in your sector. Um, very great to keep an eye on it. And one of the ways you can do it pretty easily, you can see in the upper right corner here, any query that you run on um, search.twitter.com, you can create an RSS feed for. A little lower down on the search page, there's an advanced search feature. It's terrific, um, definitely worth playing around with. And again, you can get an RSS feed for any query. Um, I also do recommend spending a little time searching and getting queries and seeing if you're new to Twitter particularly, how do people use it? Just spend some time monitoring it to understand what's the language people use, what are the rhythms and the patterns and so forth. Create an account so you can do that, a personal account, but also do, do keep an eye on the, the monitoring site. So let's talk about what happens when you're ready to dive in and use it yourself um, and start conversing. And the main thing is that you really want to be conversational. Twitter is a platform for conversation. It's not a good place to just blast out um, press releases or um, RSS feeds of your blog headline. You really need to treat it as a place to have a conversation with other people. I'll show you a couple of um, examples. A popular one is Comcast. Now, Everybody knows that Comcast has really crappy customer service. Comcast knows it. And a while ago, um, a Comcast executive named Frank Elias, and he's a customer service exec, realized that on, at any given hour, dozens if not hundreds of people were complaining on Twitter about Comcast. And he started getting in there to talk to people about what he could do. He's since become somewhat of a guru, and this is only maybe six months ago that he started doing this, but he's since become somewhat of a guru for using Twitter to provide customer service and to respond to customers. And you can see here that almost all of this is things that, that Frank has written here on the left. Almost everything he writes is a response to somebody else. In his last six months or so, 18,000 messages, and they're almost all part of a conversation. Once or twice a day, he posts something personal about himself. He'll say he's going to get coffee, or he'll talk about something he's working on. So people have a sense of who he is, and they have gotten to know him. But he's really using the site to engage with people and address their concerns and respond to them. Um, I want to drill down a little bit on this box on the upper right side, just to show you how this works and a couple of good practices. Um, so you can see here, this is if you come to the Comcast Cares page and you're not frank, this is what you would see. And among the things he's done here is he's included his full name. He, he lets you know right away who he is. Um, he, there's a real person behind this. He adds a link to Comcast for more information and also helps you verify that this is really the Comcast, um, this, this account is associated with Comcast. He's included his title and his email address, which is pretty awesome. It really gives you a lot of ways to connect with him. And you can see here, he's following pretty much everybody who's following him. So again, that allows for direct messages. And he does have a lot of um, back channel private messages with people where they're talking about a, a specific customer service issue that the whole world doesn't need to know about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Whole Foods. Um, I just want to use them to show examples of a bunch of good practices uh, for using Twitter. So the first one is that you want to use Twitter to share information that customers want about you. You may have a bunch of things you want to tell them, but Twitter's not a great medium for that. It's a much better place for sharing information that they want. They've opted in, so tell, give them what they want. Um, Whole Foods does a good job of sharing information about um, 
things that happen in the stores you might not know about, not just promotions, but for example, that you could sample a product, any product, any time. They do talk a little bit about giveaways, free giveaways, and things that you might not otherwise know. In the second message here, the link goes to a, a, a little picture that has an ad with the details about where the free coffee is going to be. Um, Twitter is also a good place to share information your customers want generally. The fact that they're your customers means they're interested in the sector you're in. You almost certainly have access to information they don't have, or you see a lot of information. Whole Foods, for example, shares information about um, the food system or um, links to articles where other people are writing about food and farming. And they do it often. Um, you can use Twitter as well to link to your own site, which is completely legit, but you want to do it in a smart way. As I said earlier, feeds of your headlines um, or your press releases just drive people away. But if you let them know what's on your site and why it's interesting to them, people will click through. And Whole Foods does a nice job of linking to a bunch of different sites that they're connected to, but giving it context on Twitter. Um, Finally, just in the Whole Foods world, one of the things that um, Twitter is good for is asking questions and in engaging with your customers. And if you ask questions, here's a, here's a couple that Whole Foods has asked recently, um, people will respond to you. So if you ask anyone out there have an unusual favorite pie recipe, when people respond, they'll say, at Whole Foods, my favorite recipe is, and that at Whole Foods part will create a link. Their message will be public. Anybody who sees it can click through and find your account. So asking questions helps generate followers and helps people become aware of you. And it's also a good way to engage with people. Um, the one thing I would say about this Whole Foods question, the second one, it would have been a really great question if they said what they were going to do with those pie recipes. But um, this is a, a pretty good start. Now, as we're talking about engaging customers, I wanted to give you another example. Um, Starbucks ran a contest recently, and there are a lot of things like this on Twitter, and it's pretty lightweight and easy to do. I'm just going to highlight these. They talked about a contest that was going to run in just a couple of minutes. They gave some details. This is the question around the contest. This is a clarification. This is the results. This all happened in about 15 minutes. Right in the middle of it, they answered somebody's question about something else. It's really lightweight, and it's easy to do. Um, one thing which I think is terrific. One thing I would note about um, Starbucks, and this is also true of Whole Foods, you can see in the upper right corner, they don't say who's the person behind the account. I don't think that's a great practice. It's much better to be transparent about who's behind it. And if that's a rotating group of people, you can, when somebody logs in, they can just say the person now Twittering for Starbucks or now Twittering for Whole Foods or whomever is and give the name. That bio is um, an easy space to change. Um, so we've talked about a couple of big companies with brands. I also wanted to give you an example of a small company that um, uses Twitter really effectively. Um, Wasabi is a personal finance site, and the disclosure on this one is that O'Reilly is an investor in Wasabi, but that's neither here nor there for this, um, this presentation. Wasabi uses Twitter really effectively. Uh, and as you can see here, the, the updates come from Mark Hedlund, who's the CEO and one of the co-founders. Um, and he uses Twitter a lot of different ways. Um, he shares links to information that anybody interested in finance would be uh, might want to follow. And these are all links out that they go to articles and sites that are not Wasabi. They go other places. And he does this often. Um, so if you're interested in finance, this is, Wasabi is a good account to follow, whether you're a customer of theirs or not. They do a good job of sharing information. Um, Mark also uses Twitter to connect reporters with customers of his who might want to talk to each other. Um, he uses Twitter to um, shout out and give props to people on his team, to his employees. Um, he uses Twitter to say when there's going to be a problem with the, the site or if they're, if they're shutting down for an hour for maintenance or something, he lets people know by Twitter. And like other good Twitterers, he also posts personal information so people know who's behind the account. Um, this week, he and his wife had a baby, and he posted about that, and he got a lot of really wonderful replies. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit more about this issue about being personal and being authentic. Um, the medium really both demands authenticity and transparency and rewards it tremendously. 
Um, the CEO of Zappos is well known for Twittering and for Twittering on a very personal level. He tends to talk about himself. Um, and I just wanted to show you um, how he both uses Twitter for transparency and for authenticity. So this week, um, or last week, I'm sorry, Zappos laid off a number of people. Tony Shea, the, the CEO, has been Twittering about that experience. And he links regularly to his own blog, where he's been blogging about what's been happening and telling people how they decided to lay off folks, why, and what's happened. So he's sharing that on Twitter. He also uses Twitter to connect with customers. He in invites people to drinks with him wherever he is, pretty much. And he uses Twitter for what are called tweet ups. Um, he talks about movies he's seen. He talks about what he's eating. He talks all the time about his cat, how his cat like threw up in the, the backyard the other day. He shares pictures of his cat. And it totally works because part of the Zappos brand is about being personal. They provide customer service with no scripts. They just connect with you personally what you need. And he reflects that as the CEO of Zappos. And it makes it seem like this is part of the brand. And this drives people to buy more shoes. Drives me when, I, when he twitters about his cat, I'm always like, oh, I need new boots. Uh, I also wanted to show you how Tim O'Reilly is using Twitter in a way that's completely authentic to Tim. Um, many of you know that part of the mission of O'Reilly is to spread the knowledge of innovators. And that's something that Tim does all the time in lots of different ways. Um, this is his account. And one of the things he does is to rebroadcast things people have already Twittered about or retweet them. So this is a set of four messages he sent the other day, four in a row. I didn't have to do any cutting and pasting. He's retweeting, that's RT stands for retweeting, messages other people have sent. And a lot of people do this now. The form is just to say retweeting, include the account name of the person who sent it originally, and then the whole message that they had sent earlier. And it's a great way to spread to spread information throughout Twitter. And it's also a really nice way to just show respect for somebody else in your industry or that you're interested in. Um, finally, I wanted to show um, a somewhat problematic account. I think they're on, on the, the, the path to betterment. But um, we had talked about pitfalls. And I did want to point one out here. This is the Ford account. As you can see, they started out, they didn't quite get the idea that you should be following people who are following you. But more interesting, they, they posted a message this week, you can see. The previous message was on July 23rd. The message before that was in April. You want to be on Twitter more often than quarterly. Like every day, you want to be responding to people probably several times a day and posting yourself once or twice a day, um, at least if you're a company. Now, Ford says here that they are um, just this week, that they have gotten a new account. So I took a look at the new account. And they did get the message here that you should name the person uh, who's on the account. Now, they didn't quite figure out that that bio field is only 160 characters. They got cut off. Um, but they are following people who are following them. And with two updates, it's hard to know how they're going to use it. But um, hopefully, uh, hopefully they're on the call. And, and we'll figure out how to get up to speed. So um, in terms of best practices, you want to be monitoring buzz, really thinking about how to engage your customers in, in a conversational way. And you need to be authentic and transparent. That's what this medium is all about. So um, I think that's it for the presentation part. Um, and I'm happy to take questions for a while here. While we're doing that, I'm just going to share. This is my contact information with my own um, my email address, which you're welcome to write to me. Um, my two Twitter accounts, the, the one is my personal account. That's the Sarah M. And Tweet Report is the account where I send a lot of um, links uh, for Twitter resources. So that is it. Catherine, um, let's bring on the questions. All right. We've got a lot of them, and they keep coming in. So um, what I'm going to do is go back to the beginning and start with those so we don't forget what people were asking. And um, at the beginning, um, Mark McConnell asked, are any of these overhead characters? He's talking about the 140 characters. And he said, um, does anything in your config force content into the tweet and effectively lower the character count between 140? And then there were a lot of talks about tiny URL, et cetera. But, um, right. Maybe. So no, the, the, I think the, the, if I understand Mark's question, um, you get 140 characters plus your account name. So there's nothing that lowers the 140 character count. Um, 
if you do want to include a, a URL that is long, um, in some cases, Twitter just shortens it for you automatically using a URL shortening service. But there's a whole host of services you can go and shorten in a, a URL yourself. Tiny URL, Bitly um, is good. If you did a, a Google search for URL shorteners, you'd get a whole list. And you can go put a URL in and shorten it yourself before uh, pasting it into an, a message. And a lot of our participants have jumped in with uh, suggestions for that while you were talking, too. Oh, great. And so um, the next one we have is from uh, Dean Myers. You want to know, can everyone here join a group on Twitter? Oh, about this one. Never mind. We already covered that. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as business goes, from a business perspective, Heidi is asking, do you have guidelines on posting um, the proper number of posts a day, just suggestions? Yeah, that's a, a hot question. I think that there's no um, hard and fast rule. I think it's a good thing to aim for once or twice a day with information that your customers would want to hear. Um, I think you know, if you miss a day here and there, not a big deal. And if you have days where you're posting five or eight times, that can be good too. You probably just want to feel it out a little bit. But think of it as a medium that you want to be on every day. It's, it's, a, it's a daily kind of a medium. And because the messages are so short, it shouldn't take a lot of time to do that. OK. And um, someone said that this was on the uh, rising topics or our, your presentation today. So I thought that was interesting yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> um, it's let's very see. meta sometimes. Uh, let's see. And. Um, there was a lot of talk about Twitter disabling the search feature because, and here's the question from Elizabeth Lewis. Uh, I heard that Twitter disabled the search feature because they're limiting the number of people you can follow. Is this true? And uh, you, there are a lot of rumors about Twitter, so yeah, fly back and forth. Yeah, it is. A, um, it does seem to be a rumor machine. Um, no, they don't limit the number of followers at all. Um, I. I I think there were technical reasons and possibly some business reasons that they disabled the search on the Twitter site. But that's different than the search I showed you before. Um, the search on the Twitter site let you search for other users. But you can use that search.twitter.com um, to search for users or things people have said. So they haven't, they sort of shifted where search lives, basically. Um, and there is no limit to the number of followers. OK, good. And the next one, let me see. Um, in what ways can emerging startups use Twitter? Well, I think, you know, Wasabi was an example of that. They are a startup. They've been around for about two years or so. Um, but they've been using Twitter the whole way. Um, and I think that you depends, of course, on w what kind of business you're in um, as a startup. but. It can be, a, because you can s follow other people um, you know, without their having to approve you, you can use the search feature or Twello, which is T-W-E-L-L-O, to find people interested in certain kinds of things on Twitter. And you can connect with people who might be interested in your services or, or products. Um, and simply using it as a place to share information about your sector and become a, a source, a resource for people who want information about your sector or um, who are looking for some thought leadership in that area. That can be a great way to use Twitter as a startup and to, to help brand yourself a little bit in an area. Um, and again, because it's short messages, it's not a big time sink. So you can play around with it a little bit and see what people respond to. Um, I, Mark um, and I had also talked a lot about how <coughs> excuse me, startups can use it pretty effectively to get feedback from customers. You can ask questions all the time. Um, well, you have to, of course, have some judgment about how often is too often. But you can ask questions and just um, solicit feedback about how your products are going or invite people to um, a beta to try something out. And it might be special for Twitter users, or it might just be another way you let people know that you're looking for feedback. All right. A couple people were asking. I, they didn't hear the number of active users. Oh, um, it's a, well, it, they have about 3.5 million people signed up. They mm -hmm. don't 
say how many of those are active per se. Um, and there are two levels of what people consider active on Twitter. Um, one is basic active, which you, people are using it at least once in the last 30 days. And there's very active people who are using it every day. Um, I don't have the exact percentages, but what I said earlier is that that percentage, the percentages of active and very active users have stayed constant since the beginning, even as the site has grown from you know, one person to 3.5 million. <clears throat> that number has stayed constant. OK, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, a, a few people are asking this, and I have to say I'm curious too. It's about um, personal versus business accounts. And do you want to have a separate corporate and business uh, Twitter account, or can you combine the two? And what are the guidelines for doing that? Um, that's a great question, and I think there's a handful of ways to think about that. Um, people who are, um, people do both. So let me say right now, um, Mark Hedlund, the CEO of Wasabi, Twitters as the CEO of Wasabi on that Wasabi account. And he also has a personal account. And that's just for friends and for his own personal updates. Tim O'Reilly uses his account to talk about business and to talk about personal things. Um, the CEO of Zappos also mixes them. Um, I think it depends somewhat on your company, on your role in the company, and how what you want to do with Twitter. You may want to separate those things out. Um, for the most part, I, I think it's a good idea. As I said earlier, it's important to be clear about who the person is behind a corporate account. And when you're representing yourself as a person, it starts to make sense to share some personal information and to let people know a little bit more about that person. Um, you may do that and still want to have a personal account that's just strictly for information about what you're doing that your friends and family would want to know. Um, but again, it's, I think it's a good place to blend the two and then to make a personal decision about to what extent you want to blend them on the corporate side and where you'd want to maybe split them out. But it's not unlike um, your email or blogging, where an, in email you may have, you probably have a work account and a personal account. And you use them somewhat overlapped and somewhat for different things. Um, and again, like blogging, a lot of people blog for their company or um, blog about professional things and then have a separate blog where they're talking about personal things. But there's probably a little crossover where you talk about yourself personally in the professional blog and you might talk about work in the personal blog. Mm -hmm. OK, good. And uh, then uh, a lot of people are asking this question too. Um, should a business follow everyone who is following them? Um, I think basically, yes. And the, wow. the, um, the, there are two reasons for that. Um, one is, as I said earlier, when you're following each other, you can direct message each other. Mm -hmm. And that can be important as a business channel. Um, and the other reason is that when somebody follows you, that's a signal that they're saying, I want to engage in a conversation with you. And by following them back, you're reciprocating. And you're letting them know you want to be in the conversation. Um, the, there is, it is a little bit tricky if you have a high volume of followers to keep on top of the followers. Um, and I don't have a perfect answer for that at, at the moment. Um, it's just something to keep on top of. But generally, you know, it, it, since you, you, most accounts start off slow and then grow over time, you can get a feel for how you incorporate following people back. Um, and I think it is a good idea. And you can always, if you find somebody is direct messaging you inappropriately, or at some point you have some exchange with them that doesn't feel genuine to you, or you, you're getting spammed, or what have you, you just unfollow them. You can unfollow anybody at any time. Mm -hmm. OK, because uh, we notice that there are a lot of spammers on various right. accounts. Yeah. If you do find a spammer, there's a couple things you can do. You can block them on their page. And, and when people block somebody else, Twitter takes a look to see if that's a spammer. You can also send a message to spam at twitter.com with the link to that account. OK, good. Now, here's a question. Someone said you might want to cover unfollow versus block. And this person said that um, he or she, I'm not sure which it is, was blocking people because the uh, user interface for unfollowing wasn't obvious, but blocking dings people. And that wasn't what this user intended to do. Right. So when you unfollow somebody, 
you are simply saying that you don't want to receive their messages anymore. When you block somebody, they can't receive yours. Um, I do, I can flip through the end here, I do have a, a slide that shows how you, well, actually it doesn't, let's, I take that back. Basically, to unfollow somebody, if you um, go to their account page, under their icon in the upper left corner, it'll say you're following them. And if you click that, it gives you an, op an option to unfollow them. It's pretty I think simple. it says, says remove, I think. The language is a little confusing. OK. And then, um, let me see. There was an interesting one here. Uh, someone said, Bob was asking, he said, you just mentioned that you should be on every day and hopefully several times a day. And while Ford may be able to do that, how can much smaller brands do that? Resources and prioritizing are an issue. So your suggestions? Yeah. Well, I, the great thing about Twitter is that the messages are a sentence long. So mm -hmm. you could send a message a day, and it would take you about two minutes. If you needed to do some research and some linking, it might take you five minutes a day. You can probably read all the messages that are being sent to you um, in anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, depending on how big your account is and how many people are trying to reach you. But one of the things that's great about it for for small businesses or for people in it, really in any size business is it doesn't take a lot of time to engage pretty deeply with it because the messages are so short. You do need to spend a little bit of time initially, um, pro probably a couple of weeks, where you're spending every day 10 minutes or so clicking around to get a feel for how it works, how people share information, the language, and so forth. Once you get that, then you know it's really like a couple of minutes a day. And you can check it a few times a day. You can check it at the beginning and end of the day or what have you. Um, and you'd still be pretty on top of things. You, you do want to keep on top of it daily, because if people are, are sending you messages, it's a fast medium, and they expect to hear back that day. Um, and sometimes they expect to hear back sooner if they have a really urgent issue. But it shouldn't be too taxing, because the messages are very short. OK, good. Good. And uh, along the same lines, um, what's the best way for uh, to group Twitter if you have three to five people that are uh, Twittering on the same account? Advice on that? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, could, uh, I could understand that question a few different ways, um, mm -hmm. so I'll answer it a few different ways. It, if the question is, how do you let um, people who are following you know that there are a bunch of people using that account. Um, in that bio field on the upper right corner, which you can change in the settings, under the settings link, you can just say who's monitoring the account at that moment. So you can say the account is now being monitored by and put in the name of the person. And it just changes whenever somebody different is monitoring the account. Most companies find that it's easiest to have one person who monitors it most of the time. But if you're sharing it, you simply trade that off. If you're doing, if you have a handful of people who are doing it all the time, you can list their names in that bio. And then at the end of each message, just put a little a hyphen or the little um, the Enya squiggle, and then list the first name of the person who wrote that message. So that does take another extra couple of characters. But it's a way you can let people know if you have multiple people posting from the same account. So I, I hope that answered the question. If the question was, though, how do people um, who just want to talk to each other connect, you can do, a, you can, as I said earlier, you, it is possible to protect your messages and keep them private and just let people who you've approved share them. So that's a way you can have three or you know, however many people in a company sort of create an ad hoc group where you just let each other. Um, you keep your, your accounts private, and you just let each other in. That can be a little dicey, because other people will find you um, who know you or who know your company and may not understand why you aren't um, letting them in. So if you are looking for a group Twittering or internal Twittering, there are two services um, you might want to keep in mind. I do have a slide, and I'm just going to click through to that. Um, Presently and Yammer. Um, are two of the, the better internal Twitter services. And um, Laura Fitton, who I said Twitter's is pistachio, she has recently published a report or listing a number of internal Twittering services. And it's, I believe it's a free report. If you go to her account page, you can click through to find it. OK. 
good answers to both both yeah, to either question. question. <laughs> yeah, another person was asking, uh, do you think it's bad form to have a handful of people um, as a business twittering? And uh, I, I think that's something a lot of us are working with, trying to figure out how to get personality into it when you're all twittering for a company. So that was yeah. good advice. Yeah, it is tricky. I do think if you know if you can sign the messages or be clear about who's sending them when, that helps. And and one thing you might do if you are signing the messages is in the bio line, um, mm -hmm. give people initials so that you only have to take up two or two three. Characters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the message itself, if you're signing them. Okay, good. And um, here's an interesting question. Someone's asking if uh, you've heard of anyone who's found a way to monetize Twitter. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's sort of two ways that people think about that right now. Um, there are a couple of services that let you insert um, ads in, as messages into your own Twitter stream. Mm -hmm. um, the tricky part there is because the whole system is opt-in. If you are sending out messages that people don't want, they'll stop following you. So I, I can't recommend that. People aren't used to that yet. It, whether they ever become accustomed to that as, a, as part of Twitter, that's unknown. Um, but the other way that, that people talk about it is that Twitter can be a very effective way to link back to your other sites. Um, as I showed with Whole Foods earlier, um, you, you don't want to just have a stream of feeds from your site, but you can send people to your site with to, to promotions and to posts and to information that's interesting to them. And if you have a nice avid group of customers as Twitter followers, and a lot of times people who follow you on Twitter are going to be your most connected customers, they'll be interested to hear about promotions you have, and they'll click through. Um, JetBlue, a couple of months ago, w w tried an experiment on Twitter where they sold tickets through eBay. And the only place they advertised it was on Twitter. So people following JetBlue on Twitter had the opportunity to go bid for tickets. And you know that's a, it's a little bit indirect, but it's a way to you can connect with, with your Twitter following network and send them somewhere else where you have some transaction with them. OK. Now, here, here are a few business-related questions that I want to uh, give you. <clears throat> now, uh, Jen is asking, how does a new business uh, Twitter user catch up with its competition in light of the enormous rec recent growth of Twitter? I mean, if you're a newcomer to the game, yeah. how do you? How do you compete? Um, well, I, you know, it's like regular-sized blogging in the sense that any time you get in, you can start drawing people to you. And it's, you know, I'm not sure that catching up is the right way to think about it, because you're not competing for anything except people's attention. And if you're sharing information that they want, you're going to draw good people to you, and they will retweet what you said, and they'll let other people know that um, that they should be following you. And it's not even a big, I mean, it's people's attention is a pretty precious thing, but because the messages are so short, it's not even a really um, big piece of their attention you're looking for. As with any kind of web service, the best way to get people to pay attention to you is to post really good information and engage in really good conversations. So. You know, keep an eye on, do, do the monitoring on search.twitter.com and reach out to anybody who talks about your company. If they're talking about your competitors or things in your space, make a judgment call about whether they might be open to hearing from you. Share really good information on your account that people might be interested in. Um, make sure you respond to people who send at replies to you. Keep, make sure you keep an eye on those things. And it will grow organically and pretty quickly. Um, if you're following good practices and really giving people information they want and connecting with them. OK. Let me uh, go back to here. So 
Here's an interesting question from Ashley. How might a marketer get buy-in on Twitter from a highly conservative, risk-averse B2B company skeptical of the business value of social networking overall? Yeah, that's a that's great a question. question. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that um, both the Comcast and JetBlue, um, the people who run those accounts, talked to me about um, at length was how Twitter has turned out to be a way for them to help validate uh, social media in their organizations generally. Um, because it's lightweight, it doesn't take a lot of time. You don't have to devote a whole person to it. Um, it's a small amount of time for any individual to get involved, um, and you can do it in a fairly lightweight way. Twitter itself is a good way for people to test the waters in social media. Um, and of course, at this point, if you need some precedence in your company, you can point to other companies that are using it effectively um, and show how they're using it. But you can dip a toe in the water, start slow by monitoring and showing people in your company how, how people, what people are saying on Twitter about your company or about your sector. Um, show them how other companies have responded and you know some of where that might have led. Um, and start slow. If you're if you have an account, start off just posting a little bit, you know, once a day or something like that, and responding to people. But you don't necessarily have to do outreach to people um, until you're more comfortable or until your company is more comfortable in the medium. Okay. And another question, Josh is asking, for a company with a bad image, um, not necessarily bad customer service, um, would Twitter? even be a good idea, assuming most replies might be negative? Yeah, um, I, do, I do think it's a good idea for a couple of reasons. Um, w one is that if you aren't on Twitter, even if you have a bad reputation, and especially if you have a bad reputation, other people um, can, can represent themselves as you. There, there's one particular example of this that's notable. Um, a, a woman represented herself as Exxon. She didn't work for Exxon. Um, this was maybe within the last year. Um, and was twittering as if she were Exxon and um, started talking about their response to an oil spill in a way that didn't seem right to people. And um, the journalist did some investigation and it turned out she wasn't real. Uh, if you're on the site already yourself, you can really help preempt that sort of thing. Um, and you can help change the perception of you to some degree. Comcast um, definitely found that in the beginning, the vast majority of messages that people that they dealt with, not just the pe people weren't just complaining about them, but the responses to them and the back and forth, the conversation, were intensely negative. But it's changed over time. As Comcast has gotten better at using Twitter and as people have come to recognize their presence on Twitter, it's really started to change how people engage with the, the account and how people understand Comcast and see that there are people behind it. And I think that's really key. If you're a company with a negative reputation, one of the things you can do to, to change that is get on Twitter and represent yourselves as real people and let people know who the people are behind it and respond to um, people's genuine concerns. And sometimes they're really nasty concerns. But keep level-headed about it yourself and be a very real person. And you know, you may not completely change the way people see you, but you might make them think twice uh, about the nasty comments. OK, excellent. And then um, one person is asking, is it ethical to retweet all the time? And, um, and saying that um, I have someone who retweets hundreds of times a day. So what is the normal ethical count for retweets? Um, it, it, I'm not uh, well. I'm not sure if she's asking if somebody's retweeting her all the time, um, but I think that there's no count per se. But almost anybody who's sending hundreds of messages a day is probably sending too many. There aren't that many people who want to follow hundreds of messages from one account. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say probably, you know, think about maybe a third of the messages you send could be retweeting. You might want to retweet once or twice a day. Or if, you're, if you have a fairly high volume, just think about it as you know, a third of your messages. OK. And um, 
Okay, there, there are a lot of comments about spammers, uh, yeah. that followers are inappropriate, et cetera. And there definitely is a spam um, problem on Twitter these days. So, well, yeah. So, I think there's a couple of ways to to think about that. There certainly there is a, a a problem, and you can deal with it yourself a handful of ways. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can alert Twitter. They do have a couple of people devoted to dealing with spam, and I, I believe they're hiring more people. Um, so you can alert them. If you block somebody, Twitter takes that as a, a, an implicit message that that person might be a spammer. Um, How seriously of, do you take it, Sarah? I'm sorry? Uh, how seriously do you take the spam problem on Twitter to be? Oh, it's very serious. I think with any social um, software, the potential for spam to take it down is significant. I mean, we have all seen it in email and in blog comments. Um, it's it's a really serious problem. Okay. And, you know, the fact that Twitter is opt-in gives you more tools for dealing with it. Um, but mm -hmm. it does come up, and it, it is serious. And I think they're taking it seriously, but there's no question it's something we all have to deal with, at least at this point. Okay. We are getting a lot of questions about um, your opinion on various tools that people can use with Twitter and about hashtags. And Thank I just you. wonder if you can point people to some resources, uh, tell people where they can go to one, find out maybe Twitter basics, because a lot of people seem to have very basic questions, and then explain uh, we're having questions about what are hashtags, how do you use them, and do you want to comment on friend feed and questions of those sorts. Okay, I might need you to repeat some of that, but let's start right. with um, with Twitter basics. Um, there are a couple of places to get information on Twitter basics. Um, Twitter itself has help pages, and um, a number of people have published uh, getting started with Twitter guides. What we might be able to do, I don't have those listed on the slide here, um, but maybe, certainly on the tweet report account, I'll post some links. Um, so if people want to follow that, I'll post links for basic guides. And Catherine, maybe um, on the catalog page for the report or somewhere else um, within O'Reilly, we can do a blog post or something else where we can list some of those resources and sure. let people know. But um, if people want to follow the tweet report account, I will, I'll use that as a, as a central clearinghouse. Um, let's see, the next question was about hashtags. So hashtags, which are the little pound sign or the, the symbol, um, the, the, the number symbol, are um, a convention people have come up with for categorizing um, messages on Twitter. There's no way to say, there's no way within the system to say this message belongs with all these other messages. It's about the same thing. So users have organically created a thing to let you know that a message is part of it, uh, a network of messages. And if, as we said at the very beginning of this call, the way we were going to do it for this call is you, you preface a phrase with the hashtag. So in this case, we were going to group all the messages about the call, the hashtag, Twitter, numeral four, biz. And you can use that hashtag with any term to that people have agreed on to um, group messages and help people find them. So for the Web 2.0 Summit, we used hashtag Web 2 Summit. Um, and anybody who included that phrase with the hashtag um, in their message, um, we had a widget that sucked all those in and let people see the stream of them. But if you searched for that tag um, at search.twitter.com, you would have seen them all as well. So it's just an organic way to um, help people find related information. The, and you can see often in, in the trending topics in Twitter that the, some of the terms ha are, are uh, prefaced by hashtags. The tricky thing about them is that, of course, people need to agree on a term, so you need somewhere to say this is what we're doing. Um, and they take up some space in a message. So they're not a perfect system, but they're um, a nice kind of community hack to um, address a need. Excellent. And then there was a third question in that uh, question. People were asking about friend feed. I don't know right. much about that. So Yeah, so there are a whole bunch of other services that um, 
are like Twitter or incorporate Twitter. And I would say FriendFeed is both of those things. Um, it sucks in um, y your your data stream from any about 30, I think, different services um, and aggregates them into one place that other people can see. So it will pull together your, um, your Twitter stream. It will pull in your Flickr feed. Um, it will pull in some information from LinkedIn, from Facebook, from all kinds of other social sites and put them all in one place that you can share with people. In addition, it lets you post comments on things and lets you post links and little micro messages the way Twitter does. Um, so it's both connected and it's its own thing. You can use FriendFeed without being tied to Twitter at all. Um, FriendFeed does have one feature that um, people who work together are often interested in. They have rooms where you can set up a private room where you're just going to share information with each other. Um, and that can be valuable for people working on a project, for example. Excellent. Well, you know, it's 11 o'clock, and I know you've, it's after 11 now, and I know you've talked for a long time, and the questions are still coming in faster than I can possibly repost them, so I'm afraid we're probably just going to have to call an end to this. But maybe we can um, address these questions offline or in another way so that they don't go unanswered forever. But um, maybe we can get together afterwards and discuss how best to do that, Sarah. That and, sounds great. And I think that um, you told people that they could email you directly, and I would expect a barrage of questions. <laughs> and, and I also understand that you're sharing your slides via SlideShare. Is that correct? Uh, I, I can. I hadn't done that, but I'm more than happy to. Well, the, you don't I'm have to. <laughs> but we are <laughs> recording this event. And <laughs> Well, oh, I, I, it's very popular with people who attend these events. They like to be able to go to SlideShare and look at your slides. And we're recording this event, too, and I will send everyone an email as soon as it's available. That will be in a few days, probably. And um, Sarah, I just want to say thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. And I'm sorry we didn't have time to answer everyone's questions. But yeah, you did a well, great job. <laughs> thank you so much, Catherine. This has been really fun, and thanks so much to everybody who participated. And we will do our best to find other ways to answer your questions. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>